This tank chat is going to be about this vehicle, the SD KFZ 138-2, uh, the light Panzer Jaeger 38T as it was known, and probably to most people watching, you'll know it as the Hetzer. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, the word Hetz is a bit contra controversial. It was used in the war in a number of documents, but most German soldiers in World War II would have not known this vehicle as the Hetzer. But for ease of reference, I'm going to call it the Hetzer throughout this little talk. Now, this vehicle saw service with the German military in the Second World War. It also saw service with the Czech and the Swiss military after the war. So it's, a, it's an interesting story. And it's also the only Czech tank we have in our collection here. So that gives us an opportunity to talk a little about that very important Czech tank industry um, that was very influential in the 30s and, of course, in World War II as well. So to go back, Czechoslovakia as a country is actually formed after World War I for the first time a united country, two real main countries put together and that's done as part of the Versailles Peace Agreement. Uh, previously the Czechs and the Slovaks had been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Austro-Hungary of course fighting with Germany in the First World War on the Axis side. But the Czechs not just were fighting for the Axis side, there was a lot of emigre Czechs and people who didn't agree with the Austro-Hungarian Empire that were fighting in Czech legions, one on, in France, one in Italy, and the largest out on, in Russia. 80,000 men in the Czech legion uh, fighting on the Russian side. So they were fighting for the Allies as well. Now, the formation of Czechoslovakia um, after the Versailles Peace Treaty, the Czechs have a real problem, or Czechoslovakia has a major problem, because in its formation, there are large numbers of foreign nationals. There's Poles, there's Hungarian. 3.2 million Germans are in this new Czechoslovakian territory. And that's going to become a problem for Czechoslovakia because pretty soon after the formation of the country, other countries are either trying to get some of their population or territory back in essence. And that leads to the Czechoslovakian military having to develop a fairly strong presence quite quickly. Now, France has been a great ally of this new nation, and it's the French military model that the Czechs, Czechoslovakian military look to, to emulate. And it's actually not until 1926 that there's actually, for the first time, uh, a Czechoslovakian chief of staff in charge of the military. Before that, French um, officers take those roles and actually take that senior position. So there's exchanges, there's schools set up, equipment exchanges as well go on. And in terms of tanks, for the first time, uh, the new nation's army gets seven FT tanks off of France. Now they look at those, they are looking at their defensive position, and they're also, they're lucky in a way because Czechoslovakia was where the Austro-Hungarian Empire would purposely place some of its arms industry because of the nature of uh, the terrain, the raw materials, etc., um, were suitable for that. So the famous Skoda works set up in the 1890s, that's in the Czechoslovakian territory. They make guns, they export all around the world. Uh, in World War I, that's the Germans borrow from Austro-Hungarians, those huge great siege guns for the, uh, um, the, the siege and destruction of the Belgian forts early in the war. So there is a major arms industry in Czechoslovakia already. But this is further developed for new weaponry and especially armoured vehicles. Now, in 1932, they order or they actually get a licence uh, for Carden Lloyd carriers um, and they make 70 of those to experiment with. Skoda's already made some armoured cars that they test, but the key decision comes after the rise of uh, Hitler in Germany in 1933. They see that they've got a major issue on their border. And the problem there that they see is they've got a very long border, so they set up through in the mid-30s fairly hefty defensive works, uh, pillboxes, emplacements, etc., along that southern border. And they're going to put 17 divisions along the border as static troops, 17 divisions in reserve that can be mobilised to go to where if there is an attack or a breakthrough somewhere, 
and the key ones for the tank, four mobile divisions. And to equip those, they're looking at building an indigenously built tank. Now they've looked around at other operations, other countries making tanks, um, but within Czechoslovakia, two main companies, one that's called CKD, um, it's had previous different um, names beforehand, but I'm gonna use the initial CKD, later it becomes BMM under German uh, occupation and ownership. Um, the other one is Skoda, fairly big names there. So both of them create a light or medium weight tank that's put to the Czech army in a competition. And it's actually the Skoda model that goes into service with the Czech army uh, as the LTVZ35 tank. And that starts equipping um, these four divisions that are gonna be the mobile divisions. And again, they're following the idea from the French that the tank in essence is a defensive weapon. Yes, it needs its mobility, but it's getting to the point where there may be an enemy breakthrough to counterattack. That's how they're seeing the use of those tanks. Now, uh, the other company, CKD's effort, um, it fails in the competition, but it then leads to this remarkable story in the mid to late 30s of how Czechoslovakia rapidly, they're building these tanks, but they then quickly find an export market for them. So these tanks, a bit like the British six-tonner, suddenly you realize that, that that Czech tank development from the mid-1930s is appearing all around the world. So Czech vehicles are taken on by the Swedes, they're taken on by Switzerland, they're taken on by countries as far away as Peru and Iran. Um, so again, just like the Vickers six-tonner, this is a vehicle that's built under license or exported quite heavily in the later 1930s. Even in Britain, we ended up with the later model tank, um, the 38 uh, LTVZ. That comes across and one of those is actually trialled here in 1939. Now, the Czech situation deteriorates at the end of the 1930s. So they're building up a large army, they are building tanks to equip that army, but with Hitler in power, he is inciting the Susdaten and the Bohemian Germans um, into, in essence, revolt. Um, and this leads in 1938, September of 1938, um, to the Munich uh, appeasement or agreement, uh, basically the crisis that happens in Czechoslovakia. Now the Czechs are looking to France, looking to Western allies as a way of perhaps bolstering themselves against the threat of Hitler and what he's trying to do using his, uh, as he saw himself, this great diplomatic power he's got at the time. Um, they look to the West. Now France at the time is politically divided. It is not ready for a fight. Um, they go to Britain. Britain with Chamberlain, again, Britain is not interested in it's doing anything it possibly can to avoid a European war. So, uh, and we know this phrase now as appeasement. Um, when we look back, we know it is perhaps a failed policy, but again, at the time in Europe, this was uh, the Munich Agreement's considered a, 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 you know, it's celebrated as a victory, but in the process of Chamberlain signing with Hitler this pact, what ends up happening is Czechoslovakia, this brand new country, is basically sold downstream. It has to surrender key territories to Nazi Germany, and those territories tend to include most of its military fortifications. So this massive 1.2 million at one point when it's being mobilized in 38, massive Czech army, great arms industry behind it, is basically neutered. So it doesn't actually get to fight, and Germany takes over. And within a year, by March of 1944, they've ended up being able to uh, separate the country into Czechs and Slovakias and take over the lot. Um, so that's the end of the Czechoslovakian armed forces. But their equipment, including those brand new, they've had another competition. The, uh, this time it's CKD, wins a competition in 1938. Um, the LT VZ38 tank is just being built for the Czech army. The country collapses, 150 brand new tanks are available for the Germans to take over. And that's why you'll see the 35 and the 38 T tanks. T, by the way, when they go into German service, they're given the uh, T abbreviation, it's a letter for Czechoslovakia in German service. Those 35 and 38 T tanks are there readily taken by the Germans, some minor modifications, and then put into service. So, for example, in 1940, Rommel's 7th Panzer Division is going forward, mainly equipped with Czech tanks at the time. 
Now, those vehicles are kept in service. Um, the 38T, it's used till about 19. 42 when it's starting to become redundant it's retired to secondary role policing duties etc uh, about 1396 of the 38 t tanks are actually used or manufactured for use in the german military um, but when they are becoming redundant the factories turn over to using the chassis for anti-tank gun rolls um, so, for example, the Marda 2 is based on the 38T chassis with an open top and a, sometimes a captured 7.5 Russian anti-tank gun put in the top of it. Now, if we go back a second, think back when we did our Sturmgeschutz chat. That um, idea of the Sturmgeschutz in the 1936, the German artillery are saying, look, we want a armour-protected, mobile, self-propelled gun that we can use in the infantry divisions to give fire support to the advancing infantry. And when those Sturmgeschutzes were being made, it's when Hitler is suggests putting an anti-tank gun on that chassis, especially after the invasion of Russia, when they're meeting many more Russian tanks than were expected. That idea of the vehicle morphing from a self-propelled gun for artillery support into an anti-tank weapon, um, that's carried on in the the German thoughts and psyches, how can we get more mobile anti-tank guns out to the infantry units? So we've got those vehicles like the Marda, but the key vehicle they're making is the Sturmgeschütz. And the Sturmgeschütz 3 we've talked about before, made by a number of manufacturers and starting to be made in very large numbers compared to other German vehicles, armoured vehicles. Now, Alket is one of the companies that is building the Sturmgeschütz in Berlin. And in November of 1943, the Alcat factory is heavily bombed by the Allies. Now, this report to Hitler, seeing that the actual production of the Sturmgeschütz is going to be heavily hit, um, they won't be getting so many out to the troops, Hitler suggests at one of his production meetings, why not take that production away from Berlin and actually do it at the factories that were making the 38 T tanks in Czechoslovakia. Now it comes back, he's reported back to him that it's impossible for these factories to build a 24 tonne Sturmgeschutz because all the equipment, the cranes etc, the manufacturing process is really set for a 16 tonne vehicles lighter, i.e. the 35 38 T vehicles they were building before. So with that, Hitler then suggests, why don't we do a light Panzer Jaeger vehicle, in other words, a light tank hunting vehicle, as opposed to the heavier Sturmgeschutz. And this is where another story from a country that uh, we don't often think of in terms of armour, Romania, comes in the picture. Now, the Romanians, they, under Marshal Antonescu, they are fighting on the Axis side. They've got a fascist regime in place at the time and they have supplied soldiers to Hitler to fight on the Eastern Front. Now those soldiers, just like the Germans, encountering lots of, of Russian tanks coming the other way, realize they are going to need more and more anti-tank capability. And for that, they start looking at building their own uh, light anti-tank mobile chassis. They end up using some captured Russian parts, uh, a Soviet gun initially, and they make nine prototype vehicles of what they are going to call the Marichel or the Marshal after Marshal Antonescu, the leader. And designs of, for this vehicle are seen by Hitler because Antonescu actually shows them to him and German officers go to Romania and they look at some of these prototype vehicles and they're very impressed by them. And when you see those vehicles, you can see how it is absolutely obvious those vehicles have influenced the design for the new light Panzer Jaeger. So Hitler's very keen to encourage the Romanians, and there's two reasons, obvious ones fairly, um, when you think about it. Number one is it means the Axis forces, if they're building them as well, have got more tanks to fight on. And it also means that Hitler will not have to supply his Romanian ally with the tanks he's making in his own factories. The Tank Museum is a registered charity and every purchase you make from our online shop directly supports our work. We ship worldwide and if you subscribe to our email list, we'll give you 10% off your next order. When you finish this video, go to tankmuseumshop.org and you'll find something you never knew you needed.
Now, what happens with that vehicle? Very interesting design, nine prototypes made, but none actually go into production before actually the Romanian fascist regime falls. So you don't actually see any of those go into service, um, but there's ev photographic evidence of these uh, early prototype ones. Now, the German designers and the Czech team that are put together to build this new light Panzer Jaeger, the remarkable story that happens now is the speed at which they work. So Hitler is suggested, he's shown drawings in December of 1944, you know, the bombing's only taken a place uh, um, that's disrupted Sturmgeschutz uh, production a month before. Um, he's shown drawings in December of 43. Um, they end up making a wooden mock-up of this new vehicle in January of 1944. In March, they've got three vehicles uh, as prototypes. They actually start being issued, production starts, and they start being issued to the troops in July of 1944. So if you think of those wartime productions, you know, four months from um, just the inception to getting a prototype running, um, is quite something, you know, this is real speed. And part of that is because the initial brief is to use as much as possible of the components from the very successful 38T tank um, that the Germans had been using before. Now, when it actually comes to it, you know, their aim was to use 80% 38T parts. In actual fact, it's really the engine, the drivetrain that stays the same and not much else is similar. But the great advantage is they're building on a uh, production line, on a supply system, et cetera, et cetera, that's already well established. So that's one of the reasons that they can get these vehicles being produced relatively quickly. Now the Hetzo, it's worth remembering when you're looking at this vehicle, throughout its production, it's changing all the time. Like so many of those vehicles later in the war especially, some of the issues why the changes are there is trying to reduce weight to help the vehicle be more mobile and be less top heavy in a certain areas. They're also doing it because they're just trying to ease manufacturing speeds and they're also doing it in responses to some of the troop issues. So when you're looking at a Hetzer um, in that production run really from uh, the spring of 1944 to the end in May of 45, there's a continuous series of changes. Um, and again, different factories doing slightly different things between BMM and the Skoda factory, the main assembly plants. Um, so again, you know, just as an example, the idler wheel at the back, there's six different types of idler wheels are fitted through the Hetzer production run. So that, so any one moment you're looking at the tank, you're gonna see differences from uh, previous month production and later production. Um, this particular vehicle that's next to me was actually made towards the end of 1944 at the BMM factory. And again, as we go through it to look at a, a typical, if we can call it that way, Hetzer, um, starting with the gun. Now the Pac-39 L48 gun, 7.5 centimetres, is not a towed anti-tank gun. It's not one that was actually put out into production for um, towing behind vehicles, but it is a gun already in production because it's being fitted to some of the Sturmgeschützes and a number of the Jagdpanzer IV vehicles. Um, it's a gun that can fire out to about 3,500 metres. The vehicle would carry 41 shells. Uh, mainly armour piercing, but they could actually take four different shell types with them. They can take armour piercing, high explosive, there was a hollow charge round available, not in many large quantities, and they also have a smoke round as well they could take. But 41 shells in that, and it's a very effective tank killing gun. Um, that's the key element about what this vehicle is about. It's so that it can be issued to the Infantry divisions that haven't got heavy armour with them, this is going to be their mobile anti-tank screen um, that can go around the place. So the whole point about that, mainly this vehicle is going to be taking armour-piercing rounds because that's what it's there for, knocking out enemy tanks. Now that gun is mounted. The very early production vehicles had a muzzle brake on. That was quickly lost. They, they, they got rid of those in the main production. Um, but it's mounted on this very distinctive uh, toff blender mount as it's called, this rounded mount and you'll see through production because of the weight of that mount bolted to the front glacé plate and the fact that it's offset to the right to allow the driver to sit on the left hand side that meant the front right was actually it's about 380 kilograms heavier than some of the other areas there on the vehicle and it started depressing it by about 10 centimetres on the suspension on the front right. 
So one of those changes you'll see throughout the production run is how they're trying to lessen the weight on that front mounting. So you'll see different shapes, different castings, different mounting systems being used during its production run. Um, so an effective gun, it's also issued with 1,200 rounds, 792 ammunition to fit, uh, to fire from that MG34 that's on the top there. And again, peculiar to tanks at the time, this has now got a remote weapon station. Uh, the commander can actually fire this um, from inside the vehicle. There's tubular steel uh, grips on the inside, a trigger mechanism, 50 drum round magazine. Unfortunately for the crew, if you need to replace that magazine, you've got to open the hatch and expose yourself to replace the magazine. But it did give 360 all round fire. Um, and again, the crew have periscopic systems on the top there to look out. Um, but we'll look at the crew in a moment. So main weapon on the front there, that offsetting does cause problems because it means that the actual angles of traverse for this gun are actually limited. It can go 10 degrees um, actually to the right hand side facing forward because it's got more room inside for that breech mechanism to move inside the hull of the vehicles. It can only go 5 degrees facing left um, before the mechanism starts interfering with the angled armour plate. So you've only got 15 degrees of frontal angle of arc that that gun can be fired, aimed as it were, and fired from. Which is why, again, we'll, when we look at the armour protection on this vehicle, the idea of this ambush weapon, it's set in a position where it's facing forward, you know where your enemy's coming from, it is not a tank with a 360 turret, it's not going to lead the attack, it doesn't have to look at potential targets all around it all the time. That's part of that design philosophy behind it, it's an ambush weapon. Um, again, an MP44 would be carried for crew protection inside the vehicle and obviously the crews would probably have a personal sidearm as well. Now as regards the armour plate, when one of these was captured and it was analysed by the British, one of the things they pick up on is this radical departure on the angling of the armour. And I'm just going to read you a paragraph from the British report on a captured 38 uh, uh, Jag uh, light uh, Panzer Jaeger. It says here, the armour construction has been completely redesigned and conforms to recent German AFE practice. An outstanding feature in this connection is that no vertical plates are used. The sloping lower hull side plates represent an entirely new departure in tracked AFE design. There are obvious disadvantages in this innovation, i.e. the limitation of floor space and minor complications in casting and machining adjacent units such as final drive and suspension housings. These drawbacks are probably offset by the additional space obtained about the waist of the hull and by the ballistic advantage offered by the sloping plates. Now, I mention that because it was picked up on this radical shape taken over from that Marichelle tank to a certain degree on this vehicle. That front angle plate is uh, 60 millimetres thick um, of proper armour plate and uh, it's on that 60 degree angle, 40 degree below on the front. And that gives it, on that frontal plate, really protection over um, 100 millimetres of armour. And when you're thinking about that, that's like the same as on the front of a Tiger when you're angling it and thinking of an incoming armour-piercing round travelling horizontally, you thicken that um, six centimetres up to, to over 100 millimetres or 10 centimetres it's got to penetrate. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that's just on the front, that angle and that thick armour. Actually, the side plates are much thinner and they're not armour plate. They're a low alloy steel that was designed to protect the crew from 7.92 armour piercing bullets, but not much else. So those are those weaker, thinner side plates on the vehicle. Hence the need for ambush, hence the need for positioning, gun forward, hence this all part of that package. You are not expecting to be turning all around, fighting and firing that gun in lots of different angles. Um, so this armour plate, pretty much similar in many ways, or, or not armoured plate as I should correct myself, this armour on the side is actually very similar um, in terms of its strength to that that would be in on a 251 armoured car or armoured personnel carrier. So, you know, it's relatively thin around the rest of the vehicle, but angled all the same to help with deflection and help thicken its, its capability of stopping incoming projectiles. Um, now, the rest of the vehicle 
it's based on uh, the same engine that was in the 38T, uh, the Praga AE. It's a six-cylinder petrol engine. Um, it can uh, travel, it can make this vehicle go up to about uh, 40 kilometers an hour, about 180 kilometers range with two fuel tanks in the rear of it. Um, it's an engine that's very reliable, that transmission system. However, the actual tracks drive sprocket road wheels are new they are actually larger the vehicle is actually wider than the 38t the track 96 links each side is actually wider as well than the original 38t track so again changes there engine creates quite a hot exhaust so that's vented out the rear angle um, and there's a series of different mufflers and cowl hiders to try and uh, stop any uh, flames being seen or giving away the position of the vehicle coming out that exhaust if it's particularly hot at a certain time. Um, and that's in the rear in a compartment that's angled at the rear there so that the poor commander can actually sort of fit in at the back of the vehicle. Um, reliability, very, very good from the point of it's actually based on tried and tested components that way. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, the idea it really is just a development of the 38T. Actually, there's an awful lot of new things here um, that actually will not be found on a 38T, apart from that engine and most of the main drivetrain. Now, for the crew inside this vehicle, they fitted, uh, there are four crew members in there, and space is the biggest issue. Um, they've given, they've offset the gun to the right hand side. That means that the driver um, has a bit more room. He's got a periscope on the front he can look out of, uh, and you'll see changes in that periscope arrangement. Sometimes dummy periscope outlets painted on the front of the vehicle, so if snipers are firing at it, they might go for the wrong one. Um, it's got a gunner and a loader. The loader has a difficult task of having to be uh, on, as you're facing forward, on the left-hand side of the gun. He's actually loading over. He should be going over from the right side um, to actually load it effectively. So he's got an awkward loading procedure to do in the first place. Commander sits at the back of the vehicle. Gunner has a periscopic sight. There are a series of periscopes on the top of the vehicle. The only other thing to bear in mind, though, is if you're honest, this vehicle is pretty blind on the right-hand side. You could approach this vehicle from the right and angles, and there's little periscopic viewing to the right, so the crews inside are fairly blind on that side of it. Very tight space inside, as I mentioned before, because of this angling all the time. Um, you know, and visibility out is one of the downsides of this vehicle. You really are um, enclosed in a tight space in there. Now, these vehicles are going to be issued to the anti-tank units of the infantry divisions. Um, the, the original idea was to have a company um, three sections or platoons of four vehicles making 12 with two extras that would be the headquarters company and you would be issued one of the variants of the 38T or sorry of the Panzer Jaeger 38T um, one of those variants was going to be a Berg Panther and there would be one of these for each of those companies to help recover the vehicle um, of course by the summer of 44 to May 45, when this is in operation, the German military mechanism is starting to break down, so that issuing never always goes as planned. But the Germans are very keen on this vehicle for obvious reasons. Number one is its price. This is 54,000 Reichmarks. That's half the price of a Jagdpanzer IV, which in essence has the same firepower. So they want to make an awful lot of them. Uh, we think there's a figure, um, 2474, so 2,474 of these actually get issued to the troops during the war when the Russians capture the Czech factories and they do an, a, a totting up assessment of how many of these vehicles unmade. There's about 2,000 hulls and major assemblies there. There's only about 70 guns um, to do with that. So this is a vehicle the Germans had high aspirations for building an awful lot of them. And they're, you know, literally they're still being built to the very end of May 45 uh, when the factories are overrun. Um, so it was a vehicle they wanted. Crews for these were initially trained in Holland. A number of them, up to about 30 crews at a time, were actually sent to the factories 
um, in Czechoslovakia to help finish building the vehicles, get to know them while they're still on the factory floor. And that was a process that actually happened in a number of uh, German factories where they're manufacturing armour. The crews are almost picking them up from the factory and almost helping finish them, learning more about the vehicles in the process. These Hetzers are issued to a number of other nations that are using them on the Axis side at the time. Hungary gets some, Romania gets a couple. Um, but they are really this idea, as I mentioned, the word ambush, this idea of them being a vehicle that is being used uh, in defensive position on flanks. It is not meant to be used in the charge, and part of that influences how they paint them. Now, this particular one's in this wavy paint scheme. Um, the outline's correct. The actual paint colours are wrong. This one, were, you know, we, it was copied when it was uh, uh, probably back in the 70s. They painted this on there from the photographs of this actual vehicle. There's another paint scheme that gets very familiar um, on the Hetzer, and that's one called Licht and Schatten, Light and Shade, uh, and that's that one that often in the West was called afterwards, or modern times, the Ambush Camouflage Scheme. And that again has two or three tones, round numbers on, um, and dots placed over it. And if you want to get very finickety trying to identify the different manufacturers, Skoda tended to use brush painting for the dots, um, the BMM factory tended to spray those dots on their vehicles. Now, this vehicle, the Hetzer, uh, it comes to the end of its life of German service in May of 1945. That doesn't stop its military service. It's actually taken into, after World War II, into the Czech army. Uh, about 250 of these vehicles are used by the Czech military after World War II, and they call it the ST-1. And probably more familiar to people, is the Swiss come to Czechoslovakia in 1946, August of 46. They put in an order for eight of these vehicles, and those first eight are basically assembled from German wartime parts or bits, you know, Waffenamt stamped vehicle parts there. Um, they are tested by the Swiss, and the Swiss then go back uh, the following two years, put more orders in, up to 150 ultimately uh, of these vehicles. And in Swiss service, they have a new engine, they have a diesel engine, they change some of the hatch arrangements on the back and the gun has a muzzle brake this time. It's a different gun to the wartime gun, um, but it has a muzzle brake on the end there. And so that gives them a, and the stowage, radio aerial bases, etc., are different on the Swiss vehicle, which was called the G13. G13 was actually a production number in the Skoda factory. Um, those Swiss vehicles were in service till 1973. And in a way, that family of vehicles is why there are so many of these vehicles still around, because ultimately many of those were given away or sold on, and a lot of those have been reconfigured to look like the wartime German use of the Hetzer rather than the Swiss G13 use uh, um, from later on. So a vehicle that has a long service life, um, probably as I mentioned, it's, it's not that familiar to the Western Allies in uh, later 44, early 45, but it does see a considerable amount of action. Sadly, because of the period it's fighting in, it's not filmed or recorded quite as much as the other German vehicles uh, from our point of view. And obviously as well, there's the fact that uh, a number of the, the war diaries and the reports on this are getting thinner as the uh, war comes to its close. So, but it was considered a very effective vehicle when used appropriately. Um, and undoubtedly, if, if that production had gone on, would have caused not only on the Eastern Front, but the Western Front, you know, the Allies more and more problems um, because it was a very successful vehicle. Um, but it's also a vehicle that I have to say is probably now more familiar um, nowadays than it was certainly at the end of the war um, because of the way it's been picked up on by the gamers and by model makers and everybody else and the fact that it's one of those vehicles that survived so you're much more likely to see a, um, a Hetzer driving in a military vehicle show than any other piece of German armour.